everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Ruby with the American Lung Association in Minnesota. Welcome to the 2016 Asthma Webinar Series, and thank you to United Health Foundation for supporting this webinar series. And a special welcome to our United Health Foundation Partners in Asthma Action Coalitions joining us across the Upper Midwest. Um, before we get started this afternoon, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. All lines are muted, and if you have a question during or at the end of the presentation, please use the chat box function in the lower right-hand corner. Secondly, a copy of the recording for today's webinar will be shared with all participants, and please pe uh, feel free to share widely with your colleagues. Uh, we invite you to register for our August and September webinars, and we will include a link in our follow-up emails. And right now, I'd like to welcome Lila Kurtz, who will be discussing new pediatric asthma. Kurtz is a pediatric nurse practitioner at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, as well as adjunct faculty at Maryville University. She is a certified asthma educator, clinical director of the Severe Asthma Clinic for Kids at St. Louis Children's Hospital, and involved in asthma research at Washington University. Thank you for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you, Lila. Great. Thank you so much, Ruby, and thank you to everybody for joining in um, this afternoon. So today's discussion is regarding severe asthma in the pediatric patient. As Ruby mentioned, I am um, involved in a severe asthma clinic for children um, at Washington University, Myself and then one of um, the pediatric pulmonologists with whom I work run this clinic, which we started about two and a half years ago. We started the clinic because we recognized there was a need um, to better evaluate and treat um, these children that had severe disease that was difficult to control. Um, so we'll discuss the, the clinic a little bit. The, the, the talk is not about the clinic, but um, I think it um, helps to um, get a better understanding of who these patients are and what we can do for them um, to better care for their asthma. So first, just um, a couple background slides. Um, probably most of you, uh, if you're on this call, understand that asthma has a significant impact here in the United States. It affects approximately 10% of all kids in the U.S. Um, in the city of St. Louis, that rate is actually double. It's 20% here, which is not uncommon in um, urban areas. African-American children are two times more likely to be affected with asthma, and 50% of children miss more than one day, one or more days of school every year because of asthma. The cost of of asthma are a pretty um, impressive, both indirect and direct costs of, of related to asthma care, over $56 billion per year. And another striking fact is that nine people from asthma die from asthma every day here in the United States. Now, luckily, this number has gone down over the last several years, with the exception of um, the African-American population. There's increased risk. There continues to be increased risk for death from asthma in this population. Here in St. Louis, in the last nine months, we've actually had five kids die from asthma, um, which we're trying to figure out um, why there is this alarming trend here in this area. Um, so myself, Dr. Rivera, the pulmonologist with whom I work, and a couple other physicians are um, actually about to embark on a project to better understand why kids are starting to die more frequently here in our particular region. Approximately 8.2% of the United States um, population is affected with asthma. Females are more likely, especially as adults, to have asthma. Um, it's the most common chronic lung disease of childhood. And um, non-Hispanic Hispanic blacks and Puerto Ricans, those who have income below the poverty level, and people living in the Northeast and Midwest are more likely to be affected. Five to 10% of children with asthma are classified as having severe disease. And that number is probably closer to 5%, but if you read the literature, somewhere between 5 to 10. And while this is just a small number of, um, of, of people with asthma having severe asthma, 50% of asthma-related costs are due to severe asthma. If you look at this, these figures, um, the numbers are a little bit old, so probably the amount is even higher now. 
but in 2009, the incremental cost of asthma was approximately $3,259 per patient per year. But again, in those with severe asthma, the costs were double, over $6,500. So what is severe asthma? So the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic, Thoracic Society um, created this definition together, and I think it's pretty thorough and, um, um, uh, and encompasses those patients that we believe have severe asthma. So severe asthma is asthma that requires treatment with high-dose inhaled corticosteroid plus a second controller or systemic corticosteroids for at least 50% of the previous year to prevent it from becoming uncontrolled or asthma that remains uncontrolled despite this therapy. So in our severe asthma clinic, we've had a total of 47 patients. And just to give you an idea of who these patients are, 76% have med Medicaid, 67% are black, 40% live in an urban area, and 20% live in more than one household. And I should point out, um, in this picture, this is, this is the SAC team, um, which includes myself and the pulmonologist. We have a, one nurse dedicated to working in this clinic, two asthma coaches, and then a social worker as well. So I'm going to discuss one of the patients that we've seen in our severe asthma clinic. Her name is Bertha. She's an 11-year-old Caucasian female um, who weighs 85 kilograms, who's obese. She was a full-term infant without history of respiratory distress at birth. She was diagnosed with asthma around age two. She lives in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, which is um, in southern Missouri, um, a, a rural area. She has Medicaid. She lives with her mother and stepfather. And she was referred to us initially at age nine um, for treatment of her asthma, but not to the severe asthma clinic initially. Her initial visit with us was two years ago. She, at that time, she was taking Advair 230, two puffs twice a day. She was averaging six to eight inpatient admissions per year, but never had spent time in the intensive care unit. She was averaging monthly courses of oral corticosteroids, but still was having cough on an almost daily basis. She was not having nocturnal awakening cough a minimum of one night per week. There were multiple triggering factors for her cough, and alarmingly, she had missed 38 days of school um, in the prior semester. So I mentioned all these things on this slide, not just about Bertha, but this is what we do prior to seeing our children in the severe asthma clinic. We do a very thorough um, chart review to see what kind of ancillary testing or comorbid conditions have been diagnosed in the past. So we look to see if there's obstruction or bronco with or without bronchodilated response on pulmonary function testing. We review um, exhaled nitric oxide if this has been done in the past. And for Bertha, um, she did have an elevated level, which is suggestive of um, ongoing eosinophilic airway inflammation. She had had multiple chest x-rays in the past, but never a sinus CAT scan or um, a chest CAT scan. She had no history of bronchoscopy. She had had an ABPA cascade done, but that was negative. She had never had immune workup. She um, had no history of gastroesophageal reflux. But she did indeed have snoring with respiratory pauses. Um, these are questions we ask, again, with every patient when they come through the severe asthma clinic because we worry about comorbid conditions. She had had a sweat test in the past, and that was negative, but she had never had a um, uh, bone density testing or um, ophthalmology evaluation uh, secondary to prolonged courses of oral corticosteroids. One of the things that we do in our severe asthma clinic, which I think is extremely important, um, although it takes a lot of time, um, is we administer multiple surveys. One of these is um, health belief survey, which goes over whether or not the families believe in the diagnosis of asthma. Because if they don't believe in the diagnosis, obviously um, there's education to be done. And then we ask them about treatment beliefs as well. Do they believe in the treatment that they are receiving? Do they have concerns about the treatment that they are receiving? All of the patients that come through the severe asthma clinic get uh, depression screening done. This is important because there is a higher risk or uh, rate of depression in patients with asthma, but even higher in those with severe asthma. The next bullet point here is the Pediatric Asthma Caregiver Quality of Life Questionnaire. We administer this because we want to see how the parents' lives are being affected by the child's asthma. 
And then we set goals with the family when they come through, both with the patient and the parent, about what they hope to get from our asthma, from being seen in the severe asthma clinic. So for Bertha, she wanted to be able to have less medications to control her asthma, and her mother wanted her to be able to have increased activity. So what is the definition of uncontrolled asthma? So having at least one or more of the following, poor symptom control, and you can monitor this with use of screening tools, such as the ACQ or the ACT. We, use, we personally use the ACT in our clinic. Frequent severe exacerbations, which is defined as two or more bursts of oral corticosteroids per year. Airflow limitation, so FEV1 less than 80% predicted. Serious exacerbations, which is defined as more than one, one or more hospitalization, intensive care unit admission, or mechanical ventilation. Um, also, um, asthma that's controlled but that worsens with decrease of medication um, is, can also be defined as uncontrolled asthma. And for Bertha, we know that she had multiple courses of oral corticosteroids. Her ACT had been consistently less than 20, and she had a history of obstruction on spirometry. So you must diagnose, uh, when, you, when you're looking at, the, um, at a patient with severe asthma, you need to confirm the diagnosis and identify and exclude whether or not the patient is difficult to treat or is it severe asthma. You need to differentiate them from having milder asthma and then determine whether or not the asthma is controlled versus uncontrolled. So in Bertha, we confirmed the diagnosis because she had a history of moderate obstruction with bronchodilator response. She also had a history of aeroallergen sensitivity and that elevated exhaled nitric oxide. Um, we looked at her medication refill history and found that she had only filled Advair 3 out of 12 months with her most recent refill one month prior. Singular fills were a little bit more consistent, and that was 6 out of 12 months. Albuterol she had filled monthly. So it's interesting. She had been going, to the, been going to the pharmacy to pick up albuterol, but were not picking up Advair, which is suggestive that she was not using Advair as prescribed. And oral corticosteroid bursts were consistent with what they had told us, that she had been using it on an almost monthly basis. So there's increasing evidence that asthma phenotypes are related to genetic factors, age of onset, disease duration, exacerbations, comorbid conditions, and inflammatory characteristics. And this is important to understand as we're trying to figure out the best treatment for each particular patient. There is an ongoing um, program called SARP, the Severe Asthma Research Program, which involves multiple academic centers um, throughout the country. And um, with SARP, they found that there were four clusters of pediatric severe asthmatics. So the first was later onset of severe asthma with, lung, with normal lung function, early onset atopic disease with normal lung function, early onset atopic disease with mild airflow limitation, which is what Bertha has, and then early onset atopic with advanced airflow limitation. So there is a lot on this particular slide. This is an algorithm that myself and um, the pediatric pulmonologist with whom I work developed together. We created this together to help us better understand and better think through each patient. So if somebody's asthma is controlled, we consider step-down therapy. Unfortunately, for the majority of the patients that we're seeing, this is not the case. So if their asthma is uncontrolled, there are several things to consider. Are they on max therapy? And if they are not on max therapy, um, we start to think about need for more medication. But at the same time, we have to consider whether or not these patients are adherent. Um, as with Bertha, um, the refill history showed that she was likely not using Advair, and over time they admitted to us that she hadn't been using her Advair as prescribed. At the bottom of um, the algorithm, you can see that comorbid assessment is on there, and that's important as well because all of these things, uh, are, all the are potential comorbid, comorbidities, have the potential to lead to worsening control of asthma. So obesity, depression, reflux, obstructive sleep apnea, uncontrolled allergic rhinitis, um, and high-risk behavior. We also include the differential diagnosis of cough. 
because what if indeed this patient does not have asthma, but rather another underlying condition that um, has led to the diagnosis, the misdiagnosis of asthma. So anatomical an anomalies, sinusitis, aspiration, cystic fibrosis, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, um, confirmation of asthma, immune deficiency, habit cough, primary ciliary dyskinesia, vocal cord dysfunction, or refractory response to treatment. On the right part of the algorithm, um, we discuss potential barriers to care, which include economic, belief, social, and health literacy, which we'll review in more detail in upcoming slides. So in our particular clinic, 28% um, of our patients are obese. 22% have screened positive for depression, 13% have signs consistent with gastroesophageal reflux, and 13% report symptoms consistent with obstructive sleep apnea. So if uh, there's concern for any of these conditions, we then do appropriate screening or referral um, to either a specialist or further ancillary testing to better define and treat as well. So there are several challenges associated with severe asthma in, in, in children. Um, as I mentioned before, the population is, is pretty small, probably around 5% of all the asthma that we treat. The biological mechanisms are not fully understood, and the diagnosis is established after long periods of observation. So uh, Bertha did not get, make it to our severe asthma clinic um, until age 11, but had been having ongoing problems for years and years and years. So why is it important to identify asthma severity? You can see when you look in, in comparison um, from this particular study that those who were not severe versus severe, that there were daily asthma symptoms in um, almost three times as many patients. Emergency room visits were extremely high. Hospitalization was um, extremely high when compared to those who were not severe, 66% versus 7%. And a quarter of these patients that were part of this particular study had a history of intubation. Now, the majority of the patients we see have not been intubated, but there certainly have been a few, and those are labeled with fatality-prone asthma, um, which makes things a little bit more complicated, um, and these patients could potentially require more attention. So um, the epidemiology of severe asthma um, the onset of asthma symptoms usually occurs early um, as a toddler, between zero to three years of age, and a lot of these patients have lower lung function as a neonate. There is increased airway obstruction and air trapping. Um, airway hyperresponsiveness at nine years of age can lead to um, an increase in functional abnormalities as in lung function as teens and adults, which um, suggests that there is remodeling of the airways. So distinguishing features of severe asthma in children. So in these kids, there is generally an increased serum IgE. There is increased aeroallergens, which is defined by um, percutaneous skin testing early in life. There is an increased prevalence of atopic dermatitis, as well as bronchial hyperresponsiveness. There is increased airway obstruction on spirometry, as well as increased exhaled nitric oxide. And um, the majority or a large number of these patients are African-American or biracial. And our particular patient, Bertha, she had all of these risk factors with the exception of being African-American because she's a Caucasian girl. When you look at this graph, the focus on this should be that these symptoms are reported daily um, in these patients um, between these two studies. So 40% of adults with severe asthma reported daily symptoms, with dyspnea being the most common symptom. Um, 20 to 30% of children had daily symptoms, with cough being the most common. So this is fairly, this is, this is alarming when um, patients are that uncontrolled, where they're affected on a daily basis. You can see here that children are twice as likely to have an emergency department visit versus adults in uh, secondary to um, their severe asthma, and that intensive care unit visits and uh, hospitalization is higher in children as well than in adults. 
airflow limitation is more pronounced in adults versus children with severe asthma. Children have a lesser degree of airflow limitation than adults. And you can see here that the baseline FEV1 for the children was approximately 77% versus only 60% in the adults. But both groups have bronchodilator reversibility. Airflow limitation predicts a significantly earlier loss of control in children with severe asthma. While airflow limitation is less pronounced in children with severe asthma, this does not imply that it is clinically irrelevant or not important. And you can see here that those with an FAV1 of less than 80% have a 90% likelihood of experiencing exacerbation within the next six months. Air trapping across the spectrum of airflow limitation is more prevalent in severe asthma, suggesting that this may be one of the earliest manifestations of structural airway changes since the FEV1 is relatively preserved. Between 11 and 14 years of age, children with severe asthma gain significantly less lung function. Adolescents may represent a critical period of lung development when the severe asthma phenotype changes. This should be a time of steady lung growth, but children with severe asthma gain less FEV1 and FVC than children with non-severe asthma. So again, with childhood asthma, you need to consider whether or not they're well controlled versus are they being treated or undertreated? Is the diagnosis correct? Are there complicating factors such as comorbid uh, conditions or poor drug delivery? Or is it truly severe therapy resistant asthma? So this leads me to talk a little bit more about the barriers um, when we look back at the algorithm that we created. Um, what we have found is when we screen for these barriers, um, there are many times um, that economic or social barriers are playing a part into um, non-adherence or lack of control of asthma. We discuss whether or not there are issues with transportation, cost of transportation, trans uh, cost of copayments for medications, the ability to um, get to the pharmacy to pick up medications. We discuss and, you know, I, and I should point out that um, the Medicaid patients usually don't have um, as many issues with the economic burdens that could potentially be a part um, of all the therapies and the cost of, of asthma, um, just because they're in turn generally um, paid for the medications for which we write, and transportation assistance is available as well. The patients that we have coming from several hours away are the ones that tend to have more issues with transportation because of the cost of gas and the wear and tear on their cars. Social issues um, are probably present in about 70% of the patients we screen for social barriers. Um, there can be problems at the school, the school nurse not being helpful or not believing in the diagnosis. There can be lack of support amongst family and family mem members. We find that um, children that live in multiple households, medications don't usually make it back and forth or oftentimes don't make it back and forth, so they're not able to receive the medications as prescribed, um, or one parent will say they receive while they're with me and the other parent um, is not giving medications as prescribed. And then again, health literacy, um, what do they know about the disease and the treatment of the disease? So we spend a lot of time reviewing all of these um, which seem to be potentially simple questions, um, but they can have complex answers on how to um, better treat whatever barriers or uh, address whatever barriers are, um, are present and prohibiting them from um, either receiving medications or, um, or having asthma control. So barriers to care are socio-behavioral processes that interfere with a positive interaction within the healthcare system. And they can decrease the likelihood of timely access to uh, receiving medication or coming to um, visit, productive interactions, and positive uh, outcomes. So with Bertha, there were economic um, barriers um, that had to do with coming um, to the appointments. Beliefs, they weren't, um, they weren't using the advert in part because they were afraid of the potential side effects of inhaled corticosteroid. I don't know that anybody had ever spent time discussing um, 
the potential side effects, but also um, the potential benefit of using the medications that had been prescribed. Um, school was a disaster for her. She had missed so many days that um, the school was getting um, Department of Family Services involved and then threatened to take Bertha away from her parents. Um, so a, um, a 504 plan and an IEP plan, um, we helped to put that into place and um, came up with a plan for the school nurse um, to help better treat exacer acute exacerbations and discussed when it was appropriate for um, Bertha to potentially have to miss school versus um, how to give the medications um, at school and when to start oral corticosteroids. And when we screened um, the family for the, with the parental um, asthma caregiver quality of life uh, questionnaire, but the score was very low. 2.54 is very low, meaning that, that there was um, a huge impact on the family's, um, the family's uh, living based on um, the way that they've completed this form. So what are the options for treatment of severe asthma in children? So inhaled corticosteroids continue to be the mainstay. It is um, uh, all of the patients we, see, we, are, we are seeing are uh, receiving inhaled corticosteroids. Um, it's important to keep in mind, though, that there usually is not, we don't usually find that a higher dose inhaled corticosteroid, so going to the highest dose, makes that big of a difference in most of our patients. Um, and instead, we start to worry about depend dose-dependent side effects. So we, if we do a trial of high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and we see no change in symptoms or very little change, then we will definitely decrease back to a moderate dose of inhaled steroid. Um, it's unclear if small particle size um, inhaled corticosteroids are more effective. And again, we always consider potential adrenal suppression and growth retardation with use of inhaled steroids, as well as um, changes um, uh, the, involving the eye, as well as um, bone density as well. So we refer our patients for um, ophthalmologic uh, evaluation as well as a bone density um, testing um, to hopefully find that they have not had changes because of the repeated courses of oral steroids. And I can tell you in two and a half years, we have not found anybody um, where there was concern with after evaluation, but then that also leads to the question of whether or not these patients really are receiving the medications as they state they are. As we're prescribing inhaled corticosteroids, it's important to remember that younger kids, so age 6 to 11 years of age, um, the, what's considered traditionally moderate dose inhaled corticosteroid is actually considered high dose for these younger kids. So we do keep this in mind as we're prescribing because if you end up on the highest dose, um, it really um, has the potential to be an excessive amount of inhaled corticosteroid, especially if you're not finding that it um, improves asthma control. So small particle inhaled corticosteroid, um, in theory, the, these medications should um, be able to be um, uh, more likely to reach the small airways. Um, there's a longer spray duration of the, inhale, the small particle size inhaled corticosteroids. There are three um, of these on the market at, at this time, beclomethazone, cyclesonide, and clunisolide. And here, um, this just shows you the uh, comparison of the particle size between um, the more common inhaled corticosteroids that we prescribe today. Oral corticosteroids, um, it's alarming that 30% of severe adult asthmatics require maintenance oral corticosteroids. The majority of our patients do not receive maintenance oral corticosteroids. We certainly do have some, but we try to avoid this if possible. Again, there's risk for fracture and cataracts with prolonged use of oral corticosteroids. Um, and if they're not effective when bursts are prescribed or maintenance is prescribed, we consider the possibility of corticosteroid insensitivity um, and will prescribe oral um, prednisone, so prednisolone, as opposed to um, prednisone tablets. Um, just because of the way that they're metabolized, we might find that the children respond better to the oral um, the liquid, liquid version. Teotropium bromide is um, a long-acting inhaled uh, muscarinic antagonist, a LAMA. It is a high-potency selective antagonist at the muscarinic uh, acetylcholine receptor. 
and it provides 24-hour bronchodilation. So it's not used for rescue, but rather maintenance therapy. It was, uh, Spireva um, was approved um, just last fall for use in asthma for, for patients age 12 and above. The dose is 1.25 micrograms, two puffs daily. And for the right patient, um, it can make a, a very big difference in asthma control. We're having pretty good success. When insurance will cover it, we're having good success um, for the appropriate patient. So the biologics, the immunomodulators are um, um, a, a great option for patients whose asthma is difficult to control. Um, these are used to, um, they interfere with immunoglobulin cytokines or cytokine receptors, um, and as a result, can lead to decreased airway inflammation. Um, inflammatory processes are associated with TH2 immunity in approximately half asthmatics. So if you have the right patient um, with the right screening, um, you can pick one of these biologics, and it's what we are what, what's to be considered personalized medicine. There are three available on the market at um, this time. Zolaire um, has been available since 2003, but just within the last few weeks has the indication gone down to age six years, which in our pediatric practice, of course, um, that makes us very happy. Uh, we will, we've been using it on kids. It used to be um, for age 12 and above. Um, up until a few weeks ago, and we, um, when insurance would allow, if we had the appropriate patient, we would prescribe for less than uh, 12 years of age. So we've been doing that for a very long time, but now um, the FDA says we can officially do that. Um, and we've had good luck with Zolaire for the majority of the patients that have started it. Nucala or Mepolizumab was just uh, approved by the FDA in November of this past year. Oh, and I should say that Zolaire works. Um, it's an anti-IgE, where Nucala works by, um, it's an anti-IL-5. Um, again, um, it's for age 12 and above, and um, we are looking for eosinophilia with these patients um, that uh, might respond to Nucala. And the same goes for Syncare, or Resoluzumab, which was just um, approved in April of this year. Um, and that, that particular medication, it's, again, an anti-IL-5, and it's for ages 18 and above. So um, we do, we, at, this, at this point, we're not using Syncare in our clinic, um, but definitely have a lot of experience with Zolaire and are starting to have experience with Nucala as well. So moving forward, ongoing research is needed to understand the factors associated with the development and progression of the disorder. And there is an urgent need for prospective randomized clinical trials to develop an evidence base for treatment. So over time, in our patient, um, she has found uh, asthma control. So she's now um, walking 20 to 30 minutes a day. Um, after several visits back to our clinic, um, they no longer have concerns regarding the barriers that were present before. Her medication refill history has dramatically increased. Um, if you remember when we started the, the talk, um, she had only filled three out of 12 prescriptions when she came to our clinic initially, and now her um, adherence rate is much, much higher, 10 out of 12 refills, singular 11 out of 12, and then albuterol instead of filling monthly, while she is still filling it um, every, about every other month, the need for albuterol has drastically decreased, and most of the time she's just using it as pretreatment prior to exertional activity. She's only had one course of oral corticosteroids um, in the last year, which is a, obviously a huge improvement after receiving oral corticosteroids on an almost monthly basis prior to coming to our clinic. She had a polysomnogram because of the report of um, concern, the concern for obstructive sleep apnea, which the polysomnogram was very positive for OSA, and she underwent a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, which um, has dramatically helped her, um, her breathing at night. She no longer has obstruction on spirometry, um, no bronchodilatory response, and her exhaled nitric oxide has um, come down to a level of six, which is very normal, um, which means that hopefully the eosinophilic uh, inflammation, airway inflammation has, has resolved, at least for now. Her, uh, the pediatric asthma caregiver quality of life questionnaire score um, doubled, which was clinically significant. A change of 0.5 is considered significant. 
so her score actually, the mother's score actually doubled. So um, they're very pleased with her asthma control. She's meeting her asthma goals, and she hadn't missed any days of school um, when we had seen her in the late spring. So things were going much, much better for her um, after spending um, a lot of time with her and reviewing the importance of the medications, use of the meds, um, and addressing all those barriers that it were present. Um, and that, I believe, is our very last slide. So um, I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, I think typing is the way um, I would say, as people are thinking about their questions, that um, noncompliance is probably the biggest, from what we have found, is the biggest um, contributing factor to uncontrolled disease. So once we can get patients to admit that they're missing doses, that it's okay for them to admit that they're missing doses, um, we can address why and hopefully come up with a way or a strategy to get them to take their medications or change medications around um, to make things easier for them, um, figure out ways. There are pharmacies in town that will deliver medications um, here locally. Um, I don't know that everybody's lucky enough to have that, but you know, we do our best to try to address whatever barriers might be present. I, I had a slide that I took out because it's really not um, applicable to children at this point, but bronchothermoplasty is something that's used in adults for severe asthma. It's, um, as far as I know, it's only being done in a handful of academic centers. We, um, we, we kind of dubbed it as, as, as airway barbecue, where um, a device is actually put into the airways that um, um, it's used to cauterize the airways, open up the airways, kind of um, uh, almost, I hate to say burn, but it's to burn them open. And then with the scarring, hopefully they stay open. So there's um, been some good results with that in adult kids, though, since their airways are still being formed. Um, it's controversial whether or not this would be a good procedure to do in children, and I believe it's being studied right now in kids, but we have not had any patients undergo bronchial thermoplasty. Mm -hmm actually what's changing the way uh, we treat asthma right now, which is um, great that more and more options are becoming available for us to use. Um, it's, an, it's an exciting time, and not just for asthma, but for so many other diseases as well. So truly the, the, the future of, of, of medicine, and, and certainly with asthma, um, will be likely be in the biologics. Okay, so we have a question about um, advice for working with school nurses and increasing their health belief of asthma because they're overworked and extremely burdened. And I know that that's very true. Well, I know firsthand because I spent, I volunteered at my kid's school uh, about a year ago um, as a school nurse. And let me tell you, those poor people, they work very, very, very hard. And um, you could understand why they might not have an appreciation or understand or have, have time to um, really think through the asthmatic patients. I recommend, and this sounds pretty simple, but every patient um, with asthma should have an asthma action plan that should be sent to the school and reviewed with the school nurse. Um, I think that the action plans are such an important um, tool for communication. Um, I think I encourage families to, and the other issue is that not every school has a school nurse, so there might be a, the nurse might be rotating through multiple schools within the district. So if there is not a school nurse there, then I, I recommend that the families identify somebody at the school who will be an advocate for their, um, their child if they need their asthma medication. So whether that's a school secretary or an, a different administrator or potentially even the principal, um, I think it's important that the families, um, if, if they can, um, communicate with the school, um, bring medications in. Hopefully they're comfortable enough with um, use of an arrow chamber or spacer that they can show the nurse this is how to use the medication. And then having that asthma action plan is so, so, so important. And then on that asthma action plan should be a phone number, not just for the family to get in touch with the family, but with, um, with whatever healthcare provider it has written the plan or come up with the plan or prescribed the medication. So that way, hopefully there can be open line of communica communication between the school nurse and um, the provider as well with any questions. Anything else? 
It looks like um, we don't have any uh, additional questions, so we can um, uh, wrap this webinar up. Um, Lyle, if you have any closing remarks, um, now is a great time. Um, otherwise, I want to thank you for the great presentation and thank all of you for um, joining us today. Stand by.